So welcome everybody on behalf of Boston College and the Carroll School of Management. Welcome to the Boston College Chief Executives Club session, Conversations with CEOs. Today we are thrilled that JetBlue CEO Robin Wright has, Robin Wright, excellent. He's, yes, that Robin Hayes has joined us. Uh, I've been watching too much Princess Bride lately with my family. Um, Robin Hayes has joined us um, as well as our host for the day, managing partner and governor of the Boston Celtics, Wick Grosbeck. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, Wick, I'll turn it over to you to do a brief intro of Robin. Uh, thank you very much, Warren. And hello, Robin, uh, and hello to everybody. This is what the bubble looks like. This is the bubble, uh, the NBA <laughs> bubble. Um, and it's my great pleasure and honor to be able to introduce Robin Hayes, the CEO of JetBlue. Um, he's known as a resolute, effective, energetic, CEO, born in London, raised in London, educated over there, and, uh, and joined British Airways for a number of years. And, and uh, I think we all know, especially back in the day, British Airways had a special shine to it, a special reverence people felt for it as a, as a really uh, quality airline. And then he joined, he took that experience, which he helped create and joined JetBlue in 2008 in a senior role and became president in 2014 and the CEO in 2015. And as one of his first, I think, uh, really visionary decisions, he became the official airline of the Boston Celtics in 2016, which we greatly appreciate. Um, but, uh, and in fact, just going the extra mile, Robin and his team uh, sent the Celtics liveried A320, a beautiful plane called Lucky Blue. It's a green Celtics plane, which many of you have seen at Logan, I'm sure, or elsewhere, send it down here to Orlando to support the guys and gather some attention before our game seven, which we won the other night. So that really was very much appreciated by everybody. Um, but I, I, um, I note uh, with some pride, in fact, or some admiration that JetBlue is rated at the very top of uh, moderately priced airlines, the very top of airlines in terms of customer satisfaction. I do fly JetBlue. I feel good about it. I feel well taken care of, well entertained, great staff attitudes, and I feel like the whole proposition is fair and reasonable. And I think people respond to that, especially these days. And so you've really helped build in our running something that's very, very special. I'd also like to add um, that when you came in uh, as partners with the Celtics in 2016, your team made it very clear how important the community was to you. And together, uh, as part of our partnership, we're not just linking our brands in business, but in the community. We've renovated STEM labs together, donated computers. You have donated commuter computers and time and staff time at, together with us. And we've done, I think, meaningful work, which I'm very appreciative of together in the community. So um, it's very important to me to recognize that because it's an authentic um, part of doing business with JetBlue, which we appreciate. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your remarks, especially during this uh, difficult pandemic time. I note with uh, also with uh, happiness for you that uh, your stock has more than, or just about doubled since sort of the early scary days of the pandemic. So you're going the right direction. There's more work to do, no doubt. But if I were going to bet on anybody in the business, and I guess I am, uh, I'd bet on you guys. So welcome, uh, Robin, and looking forward to your remarks. Thanks, Wick. Uh, and uh, thanks, Juan. It's so, uh, so exciting to be uh, with you today and um, all of our friends in Boston. And uh, good, 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 luck with the, uh, good luck with the games. I mean, I, I think we take all the credit for you winning game seven. I think it was just the airplane. Uh, I don't think the players have much you to do You could send it, it down really quickly. Yeah. We've got a key game tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I know. No, so uh, I'm just pleased the bubble's going so well and you're doing uh, so well. And uh, truly, we, you know, we appreciate the partnership with the uh, Celtics very much. You know, what, what, uh, we have thousands of people that work for us in Boston and uh, everyone's a sports fan. And, you know, where's in New York, right? It's, uh, 
there are different teams that you can support. Uh, in Boston, everyone supports the same team. And uh, so uh, just uh, really excited to have had that partnership with the Celtics for so many years now and uh, being part of the Boston uh, community. And uh, I remember touring BC once when my kid was uh, looking to uh, apply for college. He didn't go there in the end, but it's just such a beautiful place. And we have a number of BC grads uh, working at JetBlue and uh, they're just super people. Well, well wonderful. And, and we hope that uh, the invitation for you to come visit Boston and Boston College and, and maybe attend a Celtics game in the future is, is still there. So we look forward to things opening up and, and having you uh, here in, in person in, in Boston. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn uh, Wick's video off. He will join us for the lightning round of questions uh, at the end. And uh, Robin, I, I turn to you. And um, when I was, I was doing research a little bit on, on JetBlue and, and yourself, uh, I your team was very eager to say that, that you have spent and started your career here in, in Boston. So um, it's a familiar place for you. I did, you know, uh, when I uh, was uh, graduating university, I uh, decided I want to go and spend a summer working in the, uh, working in the States. Um, and uh, so we all flew to New York uh, on an airline called Pan Am back then. Uh, and uh, we had an, we had a sort of a, orientation plan in New York, where they try to, in three hours, teach Brits the cultural difference between being a Brit and being an American. Uh, and the thing I most remember for that is uh, uh, just if someone asks you if you'd like something in America, if you want it, you have to say yes. Because of course in Britain, if you say yes, when someone offers you something like a cup of tea, you're told you have to say no a couple of times before you say yes. And so if you do that in America, it's not going to go very well. So I remember all of that. It's what I, one thing I remember. Anyway, I decided to go up to Boston. So I got on a train and went to Boston and uh, was lucky enough to uh, get a job um, selling duty-free at the airport. Uh, and ironically, selling it in what's now Terminal C and our terminal. Back then, of course, JetBlue hadn't even been uh, created or even thought of. So uh, yeah, uh, it does. Uh, I love going back to our see our folks at Terminal C in Boston because it does remind me of how I got into this whole crazy business in the uh, first place. Well, that, that, that's wonderful. And I think that, you know, converting someone from uh, the UK or, or Great Britain to, to Boston, I think that uh, it's letting people know what you want is important, knowing <laughs> that which teams to root for, the difference between cricket and baseball, um, yeah. and um, that the trainers are called sneakers here. But other than that, I think we're, we're in good shape. Um, and I, I should have mentioned this at the onset for our attendees. Um, at around 12.30, we will open it up for member questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A section of the chat. We will come to you in, in turn. Um, at around 1 o'clock, we will go to the lightning round where we'll bring Wick back in and Robin Wick and I will have a conversation and we'll end um, after their message of hope promptly at 1.15 as we always do. Um, but, but Robin, turning a little bit now to um, the current situation in the pandemic, before I get to strategy of, of JetBlue. Um, obviously, this pandemic has changed how JetBlue operates over the past six months. How have you worked to sort of ensure the, the health and safety of both your employees, but also the customers who are fearful of, of travel and getting on an airplane? Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Juan. I appreciate the question. I mean, um, I, I remember, you know, maybe just go back to, to March, because I think um, this thing crept up on everybody. And, um, you know, I remember being, uh, we were down in Washington in very early March, starting to talk to Congress about a relief bill for airlines because we'd started to see some very uh, quick deterioration. I mean, in the space of a, a couple of weeks, we went from about um, two and a half to 2.7 million people flying through the US airline system down to less than a third of that, literally in a couple of weeks. And the cash that was going out the door, I mean, um, I'd never heard of, uh, I never thought we'd be in a situation of having negative revenue, where we were refunding more every day than we were taking in. Uh, so that was going on. And right here in New York, of course, uh, which New York, as you know, really was the, the place that got hit quick and hard, um, things were moving very quickly. And just thinking back to that time and how the most important priority of all was to keep our people safe. And yet not having all the information that we needed to, to, to do that. And I mean, you go back to April and May, we were down to three or 4% of our people, of customers 
flying. So, you know, we, we move quickly to uh, put sort of um, health programs in place to say to people, please don't come to work if you're feeling sick, you know, changing our uh, sick policies so that people weren't financially disadvantaged and felt they had to come into work. We uh, obviously ramped up the cleaning and sterilization and, and uh, of our airplanes um, very quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember back then a lot of our crew members say, well, what about masks? Now, but, uh, now at the top, right now, right, it's all we talk about and it's a proven mitigant to the spread of coronavirus. But of course, back then the CDC advice was no masks. In fact, masks don't help. So you're dealing with a lot of those issues that are, that are coming up at the, at the same time. And, uh, and, you know, our people were just magnificent and they came to work every day. And then we started flying um, healthcare workers into New York because the New York system, hotel, his health system was overwhelmed. Um, and the biggest issue was the lack of trained people, particularly nurses. And uh, we were literally sending airplanes to Albuquerque to pick up six people or, or medical workers to, to bring them back. And our, our crew members felt a huge sense of duty uh, around that and felt that's what we could do to help uh, get, get through this. And so, Safety was a, a, a focus early, and I think over the course of time, we've been able to improve that as, as guidance has changed. So now we're keeping middle seats free. You know, we've got face coverings, which are mandatory. Some of the cleaning procedures have stayed in place, really to try to give people's confidence, both our crew members now, customers confidence that flying is as safe as anything else that you would do. You're in mute or on. Perfect. One, one of the things that's struck me over the past several months has been this incredible um, effort by, by so many organizations and corporations that have come together and have done um, collectively efforts, like you were mentioning, in terms of flying nurses around. And you're seeing that in, in just about every, every space. So I think that's really heartening as so many of us are going through and, and facing you know, what we find challenging times and, and so many people dealing with depression and everything else. So I, I, I am... I'm really pleased to hear that from, from so many. Um, what, how have things changed here in the fall? I mean, everyone had sort of hoped that the fall would come and schools would start and travel would open up. Um, how have things sort of, have you, have you seen a shift for the past several months? Are things getting, are more people getting your airplanes? I'm, you know, you, you had mentioned earlier a little bit that, that those who do are feeling more comfortable, but can you tell us a little bit about what's happening sort of now and what you expect in the very near future? Sure. So, um, you know, right, right back at the beginning, uh, during the, the height of the pandemic, uh, we were flying about three to four percent of what we would normally fly. Um, right now, as I sit here today and we're looking at September, October, that's closer to 30 to 35 percent. So, look, we're still significantly down on last year, um, but we have continued to see this uh, improvement. And, and what we're finding is that... Um, you know, at the beginning, we kind of did a load of scenarios, I think like a load of companies in terms of how quick do we think the recovery is going to be. And we kind of settled on the L-shaped recovery, which is a slow but steady climb out. Um, so far, we're tracking on that. You know, it is a little bit non-linear uh, in terms of it kind of has a rush for two weeks and then something happens and, and people cancel and then they come back. But we're seeing, you know, we're, we're seeing that slow and steady climb out of it. We're seeing... Um, leisure visiting friends and family so you know places like uh, puerto rico you know we're close to you know we're back to nearly probably close to half of uh, what we'd normally be flying uh, and then other markets like new york um, they've really barely recovered uh, and so we do see quite a big um, spread so leisure visiting friends and family is recovering um, business travel i mean our business travel is probably uh, two to three percent of what we'd normally see so i think that just shows you that uh, business travel remains extremely impacted by the coronavirus. And, and how have you maintained the morale of the, of the workforce, the, the people who are getting on the planes and welcoming these people with, with masks or at one point without masks? How, is, how has that been from your employee satisfaction and, and safety? Well, I think the first, the most important thing is making sure our people feel that we are committed to their safety and security. Um, and so a lot of what we put in place, we talked about some of the policies earlier and there's been others we put in place uh, more recently. Uh, and the second thing is we came into this and we said, you know, the thing that our people, um, uh, are most important people is um, protecting their job. Uh, and so we've been very lucky with the CARES Act that that has allowed us ability to 
protect everyone's job. Um, and we're still working hard to do that. So, you know, even though the CARES Act, uh, which is due to run out the end of September, you know, we're pushing hard for an extension. Um, but even if we don't get that, you know, we are said to our crew members, we continue to do everything we can uh, to keep them in jobs and avoid uh, furloughs. And so I think a, mix, a mixture of um, safety and security, a mixture of them knowing that uh, we are doing everything we can as an organization to protect their jobs. You know, I think um, that's what they, that's what our people need most, uh, most right, right now. And, um, you know, we've also done uh, a lot of virtual town hall meetings. So every week we will do a virtual town hall meeting a bit like this. Mm -hmm. We've done 31 of these now. Uh, and it gives, and we get thousands of people, um, uh, I don't know whether we should use the word zoom in or call in, whatever. Um, we don't use zoom, so I should, probably shouldn't say zoom, but, um, you know, people will call in and can ask questions because, I think it's not, it's the concern around things that they don't know. Um, my last point is we've also been very aggressive at trying new things. So believe it or not, we've announced 57 new routes during this pandemic. And so our crew members look at that and they see us really trying and being creative to create demand and uh, protect their jobs and, and help JetBlue kind of dig out of this. Yeah, and I, I want to get to those new routes at, at, at some point as well. And I know um, one of the places that you had proposed and, and sort of really interesting is 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 London, mm -hmm. right? And while many are, are pairing and cutting routes from, from airlines, you guys are, are being aggressive and opening up, up new routes. That seems to be part of the strategy for you to to continue to expand and, and generate profit. Yeah, so London, um, you know, I think, uh, as I said earlier, we about 20% of what we fly today is business travel. 80% uh, is, is leisure. And we look in that business travel and we say, look, that's not going to come back anytime soon. So how do we take those assets and that capacity and redeploy it into leisure markets, um, visiting friends and family markets? So a lot of what we've been doing is, is, is that. So, you know, only last week we announced, uh, actually this week, we announced four new routes out of Hartford, Connecticut. Um, London was something actually we had planned before the pandemic. And Boston, London specifically is something we had planned uh, before the pandemic. And the, look, the rationale for that is we see the very high fares that get charged for people to fly between Boston and, and London. In fact, quite often it's, it's higher, it's, it's more expensive to fly in business class from Boston to London than New York to London. And we look at what we did on the Transcon with our mint product out of, say, Boston to LA and San Francisco, where we came on and I think improved the quality of the service and, and, and slash the fare. And we, we say, you know, we have an opportunity to do that to London too. And so that's what we're focused on. And we're on track to uh, launch that in quarter three next year and bring a very high quality product at a fair that I can't say what the fair is going to be because uh, uh, that would be illegal uh, <laughs> signaling, uh, but at a fair significantly lower uh, than anyone's ever dreamed of paying today for business class seat to London. Mm -hmm. That, that's fantastic. I know that, that my wife, who's a Mosaic member, uh, has, has already highlighted London in 2021 as one of those places that, that we're looking forward to, to traveling. That's great. You know, that's great. Love it. Safety, safety, safety allowing. Um, turning back to, to your employees, um, I watched an interview with you recently where you talked about the role of a, a CEO at JetBlue, and you appreciated and found so special about JetBlue specifically was the culture. What is it about the culture that you try to instill and, and why is it so important to, to your organization? Well, you know, when, when, uh, when you join JetBlue on the first day, uh, well, certainly before this all happened, uh, you go to Orlando for what we call orientation. And, um, the, uh, and I ask all of our senior leaders go down. Uh, I go down, other senior leaders go down. And that's our first day with our new employees. We call them crew members. And the first thing we say is there's only really two types of uh, uh, employees or crew members at JetBlue. There's those that serve the customers and those that serve the, those that serve those that serve the customers. And so for me, which I'm in a support role, you know, our job is to be there to support our crew members, uh, to remove obstacles that get in their way uh, for, in terms of providing service to our customers and solve some of the concerns and issues that, that, that they have. And so, uh, that's how we that's how we approach it. Uh, we spend a huge amount of time out in the operation um, Even though we've been in this pandemic, you know, we are um, out visiting our uh, Crew members, obviously it's harder right because we're trying to main dis distancing. We can't have these big 
in-person town hall meetings that we mm -hmm. normally like to do. Um, but it's very important that our people know that, that we're there uh, and that we're, everyone is pulling in the same direction to try and get JetBlue through this. In a normal times, you know, uh, in addition to spending time down on their first day, uh, you know, we do a lot of town hall meetings, uh, leaders clean the airplanes um, uh, with our crew members when they return them. We, do, we just do a lot um, together so that everyone knows that we're you know, in the same boat and we're all head, trying to head in the same direction. And one of the things that strikes me every time I fly JetBlue, which is almost all the time I'm on an airplane, um, and I suspect it comes from culture, is everyone seems to be happy, right? The, the, the crew members seem to be happy. And I know that's part of the, their, their job, but I think that they, they, they're a little bit more informal and it seems they're having fun and they try to pass it on to the passengers. Again, they do it in, in the appropriate protocols and safety and all that sort of stuff, but I'm, I'm always pleased when the pilots or the uh, attendants are on the, the microphone and I always feel like, you know, we're going from Boston to New Orleans today and, and we're going we're gonna to make it safe, but we're going to have as much fun as we can in, in that journey. And I think that, that that's got to come from the culture of JetBlue and from the top. Yeah, you know, I think our, our people are magnificent. Um, we try to hire the right people as well. I mean, we, uh, uh, I, I often have this joke orientation that it's harder to get into JetBlue than Harvard, which actually it is based on the numbers, although I'm not obviously making a direct comparison. Um, but, you know, we're very lucky that we can be very selective on who we hire, and that's very important. And then when people are here, here it's really it's making sure that people feel part of the team, that they feel empowered to do what they need to do to take care of customers, and they're empowered when things go wrong to solve things for customers. And we know we're not perfect, and we know that there are things that we do that are sometimes outside of our control. Um, you know, it's funny with the pandemic, all the, we spent all summer looking at the air traffic control delays, and we haven't had one uh, this year. But you know we have amazing people, and um, I think the fact that we've not furloughed anyone in 21 years of history, despite some very challenging times, I think again speaks to the fact that we're in this together. Uh, we're going to fight through this pandemic together. We're going to get to the other side as uh, as one team. I just I think that's fantastic, and, and to some extent amazing that that there hasn't been a single furlough for your company's history over time, especially during what's been happening. Um, and, and in terms of the 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 joy or the communication on the, the flights. I, I just know that, you know, as, as, a, as a traveler, things are outside of the pilot's control, right? There's weather, there, there's all sorts of stuff that's going on. But I always find that JetBlue tells us as much as they can and they communicate. So when I'm sitting in that, that seat and things aren't going the way I expect, I'm told, here's, here's what's happening and we're doing the best we can. And I think that constant communication has been uh, just again, as a, as a customer of JetBlue's, I, I appreciate it. Um, you have, I'm going to turn quickly over to sustainability. JetBlue has, has made a, a serious commitment to, say, to sustainability. And as a result, you've achieved carbon neutrality on, on domestic flights. Um, this comes with a cost, obviously, but why is it so important to JetBlue? Well, I think, um, you know, I think as a, we, we were, it's very important the airline industry recognizes the role that we play in impacting climate change. And uh, actually, uh, a few years ago, the whole industry came together to pass an international treaty that was basically committed to reducing global um, carbon emissions by 50% by 2050. And I think, you know, you go back a few years, we were all patting ourselves on the back and saying, wow, to get almost every country in the world to agree to that, isn't that amazing? And it was, but the reality is that this is issue is moving much more quickly than any of us thought and 50% by 2050 isn't enough. Uh, and so for us to, if we wanna keep aviation accessible, if we wanna keep fares low, so our kids and their kids have the ability of affordable air travel in the same way that I did and you did, then the industry has to be able to grow, but also has to be able to offer uh, an answer to the question around sustainability. And so you know, we, we, we decided JetBlue to take a leadership role in that. Um, there's a number of things that we're doing, whether it's investing in our new airplanes, so we have uh, a lot of new A220s coming to Boston to replace our 190s. Uh, we've got uh, next generation 321s that we are uh, rolling out, uh, whether it's our sort of commitment and energy around uh, more efficient air traffic control procedures, um, or whether it's investments in sustainable aviation fuel. So we are uh, now, our flights out of San Francisco, we are uh, loading up with sustainable aviation fuel. Um, all of those things together will have an impact over time, 
Um, but of course, it takes time for those things to truly improve our carbon footprint. So what we're doing at, in addition to that is making sure we're offsetting uh, all of our domestic uh, carbon emissions through rep reputable uh, audited offset programs. But we fully recognize that these offset programs are really a bridge mm. to be us better self-help and uh, make sure that we uh, you know, move, take, make that commitment to uh, carbon neutrality in our own right. It's just gonna take time because uh, the sustainable aviation fuel industry is still very immature and it's not yet scaling up to the degree that we need it to. Well, well, hopefully some of the other airlines will, will follow your lead. And, and I think the more commitment we can get to the, the net neutrality on sustainability will be um, fantastic and, and much needed. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, but then we are going to open it up to our audience for Q&A. And the first question is going to come from Lisa Weiland, uh, the CEO of, of Massport Authority. Um, we, we decided to give her the first question. But uh, my last question is, as Lisa gets ready, and we'll have our team um, unmute her in a second. Um, has to do with sort of diversity and inclusion. And inclusion, certainly it's something that's become even more um, visible in the past several months. Um, and recent examples of racial injustice have, have caused society to consider what can be done. Uh, what is JetBlue doing in this regard in contributing to uh, making racial equality more of the fabric of, of everyday life and what we're doing? You yeah, know, it's a, it's a great question and um... You know, I think um, when we look at all the challenging uh, circumstances that all organizations have faced in 2020, we're going through a pandemic, which, and there's a lot written about how uh, the communities most impacted by the pandemic are uh, quite often communities of color. Um, and then you, you uh, think about the horrific events that we all saw in uh, Minneapolis. And, you know, it really was a, I think, a rallying cry for all of us. And, you know, at JetBlue, we have a very diverse workforce in terms of our frontline leaders and even our supervisors. But where we have not done anything like as good enough job is uh, diversity in, in our higher paying jobs, whether those are leaderships uh, or, or pilots. I mean, the airline industry um, is, is actually um, blessed to have a number of higher paying jobs, whether those leadership roles, whether they're pilots, whether they're sort of maintenance technicians. And so... Um, we've used, really used it as a rallying cry internally to set some very clear goals and direction to ensure that uh, we make progress over the next few years in ensuring that our leadership and our high paying jobs um, are um, uh, enjoyed by uh, all of our uh, people. And I'll give you an example. To be a pilot uh, is still largely um, uh, a male. It's about 95% male, 5% female and uh, people of color also significantly underrepresented. And yet we know, notwithstanding what we're going through at the moment, this country is gonna need tens, if not hundreds of thousands of new pilots over the next 15, 20 years. So let's change that now. And I think there are things that we can do to make the uh, career as a pilot much more accessible to people uh, in, in different communities much more quickly. Uh, and I think we can have an impact over the next few years. And so we're committed to it. Uh, as a board, as a leadership team, we're setting out some pretty demanding targets and the whole of the organization is rallying around that uh, to make sure we get it done. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to um, seeing that when I'm on planes in the future and, and moving forward for JetBlue. Um, but, I, you know, I, again, I, I think that's great. Obviously, um, wish more, everyone would do more and I wish everyone had done more earlier, but the fact that we're having these conversations I think heartens many of us that, that many are heading in the right direction. So, um, so that's good. Um, I am now going to, with luck, with technology and everything else, uh, we are going to unmute Lisa Weiland from the Massport Authority uh, and let Lisa have our first question. So Lisa, are you, are you there and able to, to uh, join us? I am, can you hear me, Warren? We can, welcome. Great, thank you so much for having me. Robin, so nice to see you. Um, thank you to you and your entire team at JetBlue for being terrific business partners. I think together we've accomplished quite a lot over the years and, and look forward to the years to come. I thought it might be interesting to have you talk about your new strategic partnership with American Airlines, uh, a little bit about the rationale uh, for the partnership, its impact in particular on the Northeast, uh, and perhaps how the post-security connections we're currently building at Logan Airport between Terminal C and B will help facilitate uh, your new partnership. 
Great, thanks, Lisa. So great to hear uh, from you as well. And just uh, just right back at you. Just know how much we appreciate the team at Massport. You know, in fact, uh, I end up doing events all around the world, and um, you know, there's always people looking to pitch uh, airports and airlines against each other. And I, I always give uh, the examples of the relationship JetBlue has with Massport as the best one. And just a, a bit of a story, which uh, I'm not sure Lisa's even aware of, but. Uh, uh, way back in uh, the fall of 2008, when uh, we had made a decision that we wanted to uh, grow Boston in a major way, uh, I remember flying up to Boston and meet with Ed Frenny, who works for Lisa. Ed runs the sort of uh, aviation part of, uh, of uh, Massport. And um, I said to Ed, you know, Ed, we want to grow this place 150 flights. And he's, you know, Ed's been uh, around the industry a long time. He doesn't, uh, he sees, uh, you know, he sees uh, when people are, um, uh, <laughs> not being direct with him pretty easily and uh, he said you're kidding me I said no Ed that's what we want to do uh, and we spent time with him and there's a bunch of things that Ed said he would go and do in 2008 and he's done every single one of them but that's really what's facilitated our growth so just huge uh, gratitude to you Lisa and Ed and all of the team at Massport you're just simply terrific and by the way Massport just for everyone on the uh, call Massport do this uh, unique meeting every morning seven days a week where they get together with all of the airlines all of the agencies i think no one else does that like massport does and it's uh came after 9 11 and how everyone has to get more on the same page with this stuff and uh, again unique and just uh, just thank you for the partnership but back to your question about american airlines um for those who may not be aware what we announced um a little bit ago was a, a strategic partnership in the northeast between uh, JetBlue uh, and american uh, and what that is really aimed to do is to kind of allow customers to uh, connect uh, between JetBlue and American in a way that they can't do today. So, you know, when we think about um, uh, uh, New York and Boston, what that's allow, going to allow JetBlue to, to do is grow in a fairly uh, significant way. Uh, it's also going to allow American to grow by adding uh, more long haul flights to uh, international destinations that we can feed um, and the idea is to take it create seamless experience for our customers um, both in you know the ability to buy through tickets through check-in um, uh, obviously to change flights um, but also you know and then working with each other's frequent flyer programs to allow people to sort of uh, earn and burn miles on each other so we're very excited uh, it's gonna be it's a partnership that's very focused on the Northeast so we'll still be competing with American out of South Florida uh, we'll still be competing with American on our new flights from Boston to London. Uh, but every, everyone else, the idea is that we're going to create uh, connecting itineraries. And, uh, um, you know, to the, again, I think Massport's always so far ahead. I sometimes think Massport know all this stuff's going to happen before we even thought of it, uh, because they've been working on this connector program uh, for several years now. And that's going to really, um, I think, enable the customer experience and uh, allow both JetBlue and American to sell more uh, over and through Boston. Thank you, Lisa, for, for that question and, and for all the work that Massport is doing to, to, to keep the travelers safe. We look forward to, to speaking with you further about this um, in, in the future. And, and, and Robin, you've got a commitment to Boston. You've spent time in Boston. JetBlue is partnering in Boston. You, you have a lot of love for, for Massport here. Um, any chance that the headquarters would find their way up, up north a little bit? I mean, we're, we're always competing with New York. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's funny because it only seemed yesterday we did a whole uh, process around whether we were going to stay in New York or, or not. And uh, uh, actually, our, uh, in, in, I think next year, we have to start thinking about that uh, again. So um, uh, I sometimes, I, we all spend so much time in Boston, I sometimes feel that our head office uh, is in uh, Boston. But no, no, no plans right now to uh, move uh, uh, what we call our support center, what you've said is head office out of uh, uh, New York. Um, but, um, you know, we continue to grow jobs, not just in Boston, but also our commitment to Worcester as well. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to continue to grow and uh, create more jobs in, uh, in, in Boston. Well, we'll certainly keep us in mind. And, and I know that many of the attendees and, and our members would be, would be happy to help you on that strategy yeah. of, of, of shifting to Boston. Um, I'm going to We'll turn... be in touch next year. Excellent, excellent. You, you give us the date and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll bring you back. Yeah. You can make your announcement on our stage. Um, we, we'd love to do that. Um, our next question is gonna come 
uh, from Andrew Burton of Rapid7, so I'm going to unmute him. But before uh, we do that, we also had a comment from Liz Bruner, who's on the board here at Make-A-Wish in Boston, and she wanted to th just thank you personally and, and Jeff Blue for your commitment to that um, charitable uh, organization. So again, on behalf of, of Liz and Make-A-Wish, thank you for your commitment. So with any luck, Andrew from Rapid7, uh, you should be uh, joining us. Hey, Robin, uh, and thank you, Warren. I appreciate it. Uh, Robin, thanks for taking my question. I am a Mosaic member and I have been a longtime fan of, of JetBlue uh, based here in Boston. Um, I'm curious, I was, I was actually one day, I was sitting down in New York trying to get back to Boston and my JetBlue flight was delayed. And I looked online and from what I could see at the time, uh, JetBlue has, because it operates primarily in the Northeast, has one of the highest uh, flight delays in, in, the, in the industry but yet uh, has incredible customer satisfaction and customer sentiment. So I'm curious, how do you think about um, being able to achieve such incredible customer results operating in an environment that is inherently uh, very challenging for you? Well, the good news is, uh, Andrew, there's no delays anymore. Um, we got rid of all of those. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's funny. Like I, I, Every flight I've done recently is left early and got there early. I'm like, I'm quite enjoying this. But... Um, you know, I think that um, it's a great question. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a real push for ATC reform. Um, because if you look at um, the air traffic control system in the, in the US, it is based on, on very old technology and the process of change is, is quite slow. And so what we've seen every year is the congested airspace just get uh, harder and harder. And for an airline um, um, like JetBlue, in the US, about 70% of our flying is in congested airspace. So about 70% of our flying uh, is subject to regular delays. And that's much higher than any other um, percentage of uh, any other US airline has. I think United Airlines is the, the next most congested and that's about 50% because they've obviously got San Francisco, Chicago and, and, and Newark. Um, and so that is a challenge. And, um, you know, I think, um, what we focus on is the, what, what are some of the things we can do to mitigate that for people when it happens. And, you know, Juan, you touched on this earlier, but regular communication is important uh, to people so people understand whether it is. People don't want to be lied to. Um, sometimes I think we can be too honest because then I get complaints saying I didn't really want to know that that part of the engine needed to be replaced. Um, <laughs> but we try and get our people to sort of be uh, transparent. And so... Um, we also know that our customer satisfaction scores do go up when we're on time. And, you know, I think um, uh, we, we continue to do a lot of work to um, improve our on-time performance, but also work to try to mitigate some of these longer air traffic control delays that are very frustrating. And, you know, for those of you who fly, for example, at a LaGuardia, to, from LaGuardia to Boston or DCA to Boston and you come on, it's like, you know, our, our wheels up time is in 50 minutes and it's only a 30 minute flight. Those things are really frustrating for people. Uh, and, you know, we, we uh, once we get through this pandemic and, and things start to get back to normal, I think we have to revisit this issue of air traffic control reform so we can recreate more capacity and efficiency in the system. Great, that's a, that's a good question. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm gonna turn to Randy Seidel of Revenue Acceleration. Randy, uh, Good to see or, or hear from you again today. Uh, you're up. Hey, uh, thanks, Robin. Love JetBlue. Uh, gr great to have you flying out of Boston so much. I uh, just have to fly to fly to more cities. Um, one, one suggestion is I think there's a big niche to uh, fly to Eagle Vale. Nobody else flies nonstop, so I'll put in the plug for that selfishly. No and, then, uh, <laughs> and then also with uh, Mosaic, um, you know, given the COVID situation, do you anticipate grandfathering Mosaic? Uh, members for uh, uh, next year? I think we may have already have done that. Great. Uh, but I will have someone check that before the end of this uh, uh, this this event. But I, I think we've uh, done that. Um, but I will I will check. Uh, but no, Randy, thanks for being a mosaic and uh, thanks for flying us. And um, look, I think again, one of the things that we're excited about the partnership with American is it's going to open up new destinations. And there are a number of routes that are sort of marginal at the moment, but I think uh, with some of the additional demand that can be created with a partnership with American, we can, uh, we can get on our, our, our network. And so, um, you know, we're going to continue to build the breadth of destinations uh, out of Boston uh, over the coming years. You've got our complete commitment to, to do that. Great. Thanks. 
Thank Wonderful. You, thanks, Randy, and, and thanks for asking the mosaic question. So I don't have to for my wife, but but I, I do believe what what Robin is telling is something that my wife was was happy to hear. So um, again, uh, good question. Uh, next up is Quincy Miller from Eastern Bank. Uh, Quincy, um, it's been a while, but but happy to have you joining us. And the microphone is all yours. With any luck. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Quincy. Perfect. Thanks. So another mosaic client here. Wow, look at that. And and it did get extended, I know. I was on top of that one. Uh, okay, good. Uh, but my question is, you've talked a lot about the impact of COVID. And I think I have more of a, a future-looking question for you, which is, you know, what do you see as the long-term impact of COVID? I mean, for example, one of the things we've seen is some of the airlines actually waive change fees permanently and eliminate those. At least it sounds like that's what they've done. And I know that's always been one of the great perks of Mosaic. So I'm just interested in, you know, your future thoughts. Once there is a vaccine, as we look mm -hmm. forward, will there be things in, you know, will the business operate differently? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're trying to pick through is what do we think is going to last and uh, stay? And what do we think is temporary? And I think things like, um, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I was saying to Juan before we went live that we're getting our highest ever customer satisfaction scores now. And a lot of that relates to just the cleanliness and the hygiene of the airplanes. I think that's going to stay. You know, I think the old days of getting on a flight, and there's a few crumbs on the floor. I mean, I think those days are thankfully gone. And so I think we're going to, we're going to be better uh, at that. Uh, you know, and I completely agree with you on about the change fees. I mean, we were actually the first airline to, when we go, went into COVID to, wave change fees. I remember doing a CNBC article in April, right here in this building in New York, um, talking about how I think change fees are going to go, because I think that it's going to be very hard to force airlines to, um, uh, uh, you know, make people fly then they're not well. So we've actually continued to roll all of our change fees through to the end of February. So anyone that's not booking a trip, that is, so that's any flight that you book on the internet uh, or with us or travel agent um, by February 28th for any time into next year, no change fees. Um, and then what you saw some other airlines announce uh, a month ago, ago was like change fees going. Um, it's actually though not what they, it's what they, it's what people read into it. What they actually said was that they are um, going to reintroduce no changes and cancellations to their basic economy fare. So what they've said is, if you buy one of their lower fares, they will, um, you, you, from the 1st of January, you won't be able to change or cancel those. If you buy one of their regular fares, that's where you can change them. So I actually, we, I, you know, I, what we, our view about what they've done is reintroduce cancellation penalties for over half their fares. Um, we don't think that's appropriate in the current environment. And, uh, you know, I think as we, as we continue into next year, uh, I think, um, you know, change fees are something that are going to be uh, much less common. And then back to your question about the mosaic, this is a really good question. You know, one of the big benefits of being a mosaic was there were no change fees. Uh, suddenly, that benefit is more widely available. So, you know, we're giving some thought to that now about how we maintain that value proposition for mosaic when the rules of the game have changed around change fees. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers your question, uh, Quincy, as best I can today. Excellent. Thank you very much. Apparently, our members are huge JetBlue fans because a lot of the questions you're getting are, are you know, Mosaic and, and Roots and, and everything else. So um, I'm going to turn... Again, I'm, uh, Juan, just to say, uh, can you go and see if Don is in the building and bring him here? Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and introduce you to someone in a minute who runs the Mosaic program and then everyone can see him uh, and can ask him any questions at any time in the future. So uh, yeah. we'll do that yeah. in a minute. If, if you could just give us his cell number, that would be great so that every time we're heading to, to Logan, we could give him a quick call to, to make sure we're in good shape. Give you his home number, his home address, his cell, we'll give you everything. Everything. Fan, fantastic. No, no it's, all, it's all about customer service. Yep. Um, our, our next question is going to come from Diane Darling, but be, before we turn to her, um, I've, I've received a question from one of our members who couldn't join us but wanted me to ask the question, and I'm sure she'll watch this on, on YouTube later. Uh, Joanne Simons from Northeast Arc, our C, uh, CEO at Northeast Arc, says, for those of us who, who fly commercial, we love JetBlue. When booking, will we be able to see 
whether a middle seat has been blocked and, it, and if so, for how long would the safety measure be in place? Yeah, a great question. So uh, right now we are blocking the middle seats through to uh, the 15th of October, um, which is obviously a, a few weeks away. Um, we, we'll, we'll, we're going to kind of uh, announce in the next day or two what we plan to do after the 15th of October, but rest assured we're going to continue to uh, put significant caps on our flight so that there's plenty of room to uh, spread out. One of the things, you know, it's just one of the things that we got to get better at is when groups are traveling together, right? So if they're your family of four or five, you're traveling, you don't necessarily want to be split over three sets of seats. And so we're just thinking, but then people get on the airplane and they see people there say, well, the middle seats aren't free. Well, they are, but they're traveling together, but you don't necessarily know that. So we're just trying to work through um, how we phrase it, how we say it, but we are going to continue with, uh, you know, blocking our flights, at least for the foreseeable a future to give people a sense of space and distance on board. That's great. I, I know that's so important to many of us as we, we contemplate that first trip on an, on an airplane um, or continued travel. Uh, and you mentioned group sales. I should, uh, group travel, I should mention um, for the past eight years, I have led a group of about 20 Boston College undergraduate students for a service trip down to New Orleans. Um, JetBlue flies direct from Boston to New Orleans and also partnered with the World War II Museum down there. And so mm -hmm. we have been consistent JetBlue travelers. Right. Um, and that partnership between JetBlue and the city of New Orleans and the World War II Museum has been fantastic. And so I, I thank you on behalf of our students going down there to do some good community service, uh, rebuilding houses post Katrina for, for that. Um, Diane Darling, with luck, we can unmute you and give you the uh, microphone. I think. It's Diane Durkin, not Diane Darling. Sorry, Diane. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm also a mosaic. Love you. Um, and I heard you on Squawk Box this morning. Oh. So um, could you highlight in a little bit more detail what you think uh, the industry needs after the CARE Act, which mm -hmm. is disappearing shortly, mm -hmm. um, what you think the industry is going to need in order to survive because obviously we've got a longer time period going here before people are really feeling comfortable traveling. Yeah, thanks, Diane. And just a bit of historical background for everyone who may not be aware. Uh, what happened in the uh, original CARES bill was there was a uh, $25 billion provision uh, for the airline industry uh, in the form of a grant um, of which 70% of it uh, does not need to be paid back. 30% of it does need to pay back, be paid back. And that was to really uh, pay people to stay working for the airlines. And the alternative back in April and May, if we had brought back in March or April, if we hadn't have had that, the reality is probably most airlines would have furloughed 80 to 90% of their workforce. And if you look at what then would be paid in federal uh, unemployment benefit, state unemployment benefit, uh, the taxes that would be lost to the treasury, it was actually a very cost-effective solution um, to put the CARES Act in place that allowed airlines to keep people in jobs. And as a condition of that, then we had to commit to keeping everyone in, in jobs, which was, uh, which was done. Uh, back to Diane's point, that is due to run out on the 30th of uh, September. So uh, we are working uh, as an airline community and as uh, with our labor partners on trying to persuade Congress to extend it. I was down in DC this week with some of my colleagues and, and labor leaders, and we have very good bipartisan support. And, and the proposal is a clean extension. So the same deal uh, going forward for another six months that were in, in exchange, all the same commitments are in place about not fur furloughing everyone. And the concern is if this isn't done by next September, then um, airlines are going to have to furlough potentially up to 100,000 people. And it's not just the people that go, it's the airplanes that get parked. And what we've seen from previous uh, types of uh, shocks like this back in 01 and 08, which you know, were nothing like this, um, we saw a lot of service loss to medium and smaller communities. So you know, airports like Boston are just fine. Airports like New York will just be fine. Uh, but then you've got all these secondary airports where the, they'll lose service very quickly. Uh, and once they've lost service, it can take years to get them back. And so, you know, our argument is let's keep, keep the industry together, 
We think uh, post-vaccine, uh, the industry, the travel hospitality sector can recover very quickly. And this offers great value for money for the government as well, because they're going to pay the same. Um, and if people are furloughed, they lose health care. Health care costs are burdened on states. Uh, they lose access to pensions. If we keep them on our payroll, you know, the uh, employers continue to meet all those obligations. So that's what we're working on. And uh, we have a week to get it done. Uh, we have good bipartisan support. What we're struggling with at the moment is there's no vehicle for it because uh, it really should be part of a broader um, bipartisan CARES uh, 2 or CARES 3 bill, depending on how you can, uh, count that. And as you know, um, there is an alignment on that yet. There are some standalone bills that are in the House and the Senate on this. Um, and there is the possibility of executive action by the, the White House who are supportive of doing something. Um, but neither of those things, I think, are as effective as a bipartisan bill. So that's JetBlue's preference and that's uh, industry's preference. And I am going to introduce you to Donny. Donny, uh, what we're doing here is the Boston College Chief Executive Club. And we have all these amazing CEOs. They're all Mosaic members. And uh, I just wanted to introduce you because you are Mr. Mosaic. So come over here, Donny. We're going to socially distance and I'm just going to slide Donny in. This is Donny, everybody. <laughs> hey, good uh, afternoon. Donny runs our loyalty program, Mosaic program. Uh, and uh, he's here for you. He's very responsive to our customers and we'll be happy to help at any time. Right, they, Donny? Absolutely. These are all your Mosaics. So they, <laughs> they all want to know how you're going to keep the program valuable uh, when the change fees are free for everybody because they love the no changes but of course they can going to be able to get that and I have explained that's a bit of a trickery because half the fares on other airlines are still going to have change fees Correct. but you're working on making Mosaic bigger and better aren't you? Absolutely we're yeah. actually uh, you know no, no one no one hopes for a pandemic but we're actually uh, looking at this as an opportunity as we come out and through the recovery how can we continue to innovate and uh, really make Mosaic even better. So thank you for all of our mosaics out there. Robin, thank you for the introduction. And Donnie, thank you for, for thank joining you, us. I've been pleased with how many people are mosaic members and have questions. Um, yeah. and, and Robin promised your home and cell numbers for everybody. So uh, yeah. expect the phones to light up this evening. Yes, um, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely do that. Yeah, <laughs> outstanding. Um, next up is going to be um, John Morris from Crestwood Advisors. And just that we know that um, uh, Jim uh, will be next. Jim Roosevelt is on, on deck. But um, John, hopefully you're, you're here with us now. And I think you are hiding under a Robert Ick. So if the team is trying to unmute you. We call that Zoom lurking. Lurking is someone yes. else's name. Uh, he wants credit for a good question, but if, if we can don't want question. Can you hear me now? Question. Yes, we can. Thanks okay, for joining us, yeah. uh, Sorry, I, I, uh, I co-opted it, it uh, even though I'm a VC uh, CEO member. Um, thanks, Warren. Uh, Robin, thanks for being a, a part of today's uh, interesting conversation. I have a two-pronged question. One, how does JetBlue consider going to a, a destination market like Bozeman, Montana, which you now offer direct service? Um, and I'm going to jump on Randy Seidel's. Uh, earlier comment about Eagle Vale, but because of the changes in work habits because of the pandemic, people aren't necessarily working in urban settings any longer, but often in more destination locations, leisure destination locations, consider Florida or the West or other parts of the country. Um, does that affect some of uh, JetBlue's thinking about adding uh, routes or in maybe a more limited way, direct flights out of Boston to some you know, places like Jackson Hole, or maybe it's uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Give us some thoughts, at least on that first and second question, if you could. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a really, really good point. And you're absolutely right. And I, I'll be the first to say to you that we don't really have a handle yet on how things are going to change in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how people are going to think about destinations. I mean, I will tell you, uh, September is nor normally a lousy month for leisure. Um, but we have got people flying that never normally fly in September. So, um, we know there's uh, an interest in sort of outdoor, more outdoor vacations. So we try to tap into that. Um, you know, as I said earlier, we've announced 54 new routes uh, this year, and maybe 57 now. Uh, many of those are, we're trying things because we think that uh, there's a strong preference for direct flights as well. You know, I think for people who are flying, we see a strong preference for direct flights versus connecting. And I think um, as, uh, it's unbelievable what's going on. I was going down to DC on Tuesday, 
and I'm looking at, at the, the flights, another airline, and there's like two flights a day between DCA and LaGuardia, right? I mean, we're used to having a flight every 30 to 60 minutes. So uh, it's crazy what's going on at the moment. So I think direct flights, uh, more direct flights from uh, Boston uh, and our other sort of major focus cities, you're definitely going to see uh, you're, you're definitely going to see more of that. Um, I'd love to do Jackson Hole, but unfortunately, we need a uh, we don't have the right airplane for that uh, from Boston. It actually needs to be a Airbus 319 or a Boeing 320. Can't can't uh, can't get in there. Um, but you know, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, trying things like Bozeman and other destinations uh, that you've mentioned and others that we're thinking about, I think you're going to see more and more of that. The other good news at the moment is we have airplanes to spare, which we don't normally have. Uh, and so we can actually do some of these flights as daylight flights instead of the dreaded red eyes, which uh, is very efficient from an aircraft utilization point of view, but isn't always popular uh, with, uh, with uh, travelers. Ron, you're on mute again. Sorry, they've decided to do some leaf blowing outside our office and, and then there was a car alarm, so I, I apologize. <laughs> um, but, but you're at old hat at these meetings, so thanks for, for letting me know. Sometimes I, I go for a while. Um, we have time for two more questions before we bring Wick back into our lightning round. Uh, first, I'm going to turn to Jim Roosevelt from Beryl Dana and then John Speck from Coaching for Change. We'll get our last question. But, but Jim, hopefully you're there and, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much, Warren. Uh, and, and glad you're able to put these virtual meetings together. And Robin, thank you for this very informative uh, presentation. Uh, our family are big JetBlue fans and consequently right. because of flights I had to cancel in March, I'm heavily invested in your travel bank uh, at the moment and looking forward to being able to spend that money. I wanted to mention that uh, some of our extended family who live out in the San Francisco Bay Area, when they found that for weeks they couldn't go outside their house and could, could barely breathe inside their house, the fact that they could get on JetBlue with a, with a middle seat block led them to come here to uh, uh, ride out the uh, smoke and fires on Martha's Vineyard. So it had a direct effect on their making that decision, and we're very happy they were uh, they were able uh, to do that. Uh, uh, one really local question uh, is: uh, I think you may have had to suspend service to Worcester mm -hmm. uh, in this situation, and what do you think are the longer-term prospects for that? No, uh, yeah, it's a temporary suspension. Um, you know, I think uh, just the, the challenge we had with a, you know, in a, mar a market like, uh, for example, Boston, Orlando, where we may have flown four or five a day, you know, you go down to maybe one or two a day and you can uh, carry, the, carry the demand. On a market like Worcester, say to Orlando, you know, there was just so little demand. It uh, didn't, it wasn't really effective to, uh, cost effective to continue to do it. But uh, you know, um, we will be back to Worcester, and uh, if we didn't come back to Worcester, I think Ed Frenny would track me down and uh, make sure we were back pretty quickly. So, uh, <laughs> and given that uh, everyone at JetBlue is scared of Ed, uh, I think uh, you can uh, safely assume that we'll be back to Worcester. Thanks, Robin. Wonderful. We're, we're looking to that route opening up. Uh, as, as I indicated, we have our last question from John Speck, Coaching for Change, and then we'll bring Wick back in for our lightning round of questions with Robin. But John, hopefully you're there with us. John, are you there? No? Um, let me see. I think I have his question here if he's not able to join us. Um, he, he asked about... Um, you saw that you're adding 24 new routes or so, and he was hoping to get a feel for how many employees that would, would mean that you would be bringing back onto the JetBlue um, team, or new employees. Yeah, it's really, um, it's, uh, re really uh, not so much about new uh, employees at the moment. It's really, you know, we have a very large surplus of, of people because our flight activity is about 45% of what it would normally be. So I think the idea of these extra flights are really allowing us to just put our current people uh, to work and, and obviously to protect jobs over the long term. And the, the, uh, again, the CARES Act gives, um, uh, requires airlines to keep people through to the end of September, but from the 1st of October, uh, those restrictions go. And so, as I was mentioning earlier, rather than furloughing, uh, we're keen to uh, 
uh, you know, take advantage of the opportunities that the pandemic brings, add new flights. I mean, of the 57 new flights we've added this summer, not all of those are going to work. Um, some will, many will. Um, but, you know, we, 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 we got to try these things. Yeah, we got to, we're talking earlier about Boston Bozeman. We've got to find those, uh, those opportunities that perhaps we wouldn't have ever got to in a normal time and try and make them work. Well, wonderful. Um, I, we're looking forward to more routes, certainly from here in Boston, but, but for JetBlue's expansion. Um, Wick, I think we're going to be able to unmute you and bring your video back on. So let's see if we can, we can do that. There we go. As we Andy. get ready for the, the lightning round of, of questions. This is um, scary, the lightning round. I yeah, no, I put, you, you better be, you better be ready. Cause I know Wick is, I've, I've seen him in the, uh, the, the last second offense and, and, and he's good at this. Um, uh, so what, one of the things that I find fascinating as I go through this with CEOs is finding out what your first paying job was. Um, and, and how that sort of set you up on, on this trajectory. So Robin, what was your first paying job? Uh, I was a paper boy at the age of 11, uh, earning one pound a week, uh, delivering newspapers uh, seven days a week. So I earned about uh, uh, 14, I think about 14 pence a day. Um, it was about a 45 minute round. So my hourly pay was about 20 pence. That's, that's outstanding. I'm, I've been amazed as I ask these questions. I would say almost a third to a half of our of our CEOs started off as as you know delivering papers on on routes, whether it's bikes or walking. Um, and clearly, that that ability to get up every morning early, regardless of the weather, and, and do that has has some sort of impact on success. So you also encourage... read you also read a lot. Yeah. Yes, for, you're reading for, you're reading for papers. You're reading every paper. Yeah, Wick, what was your first job? I was a mover at New England Household Moving and Storage in Natick for $5 an hour when I was a senior in high school. And then after my freshman year in college as well, a little bit or something like that. Anyway, two summers at five bucks an hour. And uh, there were more senior movers uh, who would then direct me to uh, take, you know, the, the washing machine down two <laughs> of stairs with like a strap and the, on my back and all this stuff. I mean, it was... It was serious work, and uh, I never knew that often the people would tip the movers because it didn't trickle down to me. But uh, taught me that uh, you know you can get the you can <laughs> how to carry heavy things. I guess I, I I think there's an inverse proportion to the size and weight of something being moved and the inability or lack of elevator to get there. From from what I've seen, now, these were walk ups. These were not elevator yeah. buildings. Yeah. See, um, a, a more sort of fun question, I guess, is, um, Robin, what's the last song or album that you, that you listened to? What was the last music that you intended to, uh, to, to flip on and, and sort of create whatever environment you're after? Well, I'm extremely boring about music. So I only really listen to one thing, which is Dire Straits. Oh, Mark Knopfler. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. That's, that's your consistent music? Well, yeah, I mean, that's my go-to music. Uh, you know, my kids do do these playlists for me, but uh, I'm a creature of habit, and uh, I grew up with Dire Straits, and uh, it's what I like listening to. A bit of Elton John, you know, I mean, uh, i sort of lucky enough to see, saw him here in Brooklyn, actually, at the, uh, um, uh, at the uh, um, you know, the, uh, there's, a, there's a basketball team, I think, that plays there. Um, and um, uh, they were great. So, you know, you know yeah. <laughs> So look, I'm an 80s guy, right? I grew up in, with 80s music and that's kind of what I'm, all I listen to really. And, and, and I don't know, Robin, if you know this about Wick, but he's an accomplished drummer and a member of his own band. Uh, so, so other than your own band, Wick, what's the music that, that you'll the listen to? The accomplished part is the big question. Um, well, I'll tell you, music, it's interesting that you said uh, music because I brought my project for the, for the bubble here is the bass so that's my new bass guitar there if i'm gonna get oh into, wow look at that yeah yeah if i'm gonna get into the picture and uh last night after the game i came back and i played uh probably 45 minutes of led zeppelin tom petty and uh little acdc my first song i learned on the bass is hell's bells because it's actually only three notes and it's a killer song so uh but it's a blast so i've been listening to the classic british hard rock and, and I'm hoping that your room is adjacent or right above some of the players on the on the Miami Heat. So I'm yeah, hoping that tonight, I, the amp does have some power. I brought the amp down with me, but uh, I 
put it down at like one. I was just trying to be <laughs> mellow. I, I think tonight you could crank it to 11 as they did with Spinal Tap. So <laughs> Turn it off, yeah. big, big fan. Um, favorite guilty food, Robin? Favorite guilty food? Yeah, guilty oh. food. Oh, look, all I eat is uh, all I eat is guilty food. You know, I, I got a I got a I got a sweet tooth, so I'm uh, known to uh, smuggle. Well, I shouldn't say smuggle, I suppose, to import uh, some English candy uh, or sweets, as we call them. Um, so, uh, you know, probably uh, too much uh, too much of that. And uh, you know, I don't uh, I don't I don't go to McDonald's often, but every now and then it's nice to sneak in a Big Mac and uh, just again remember your childhood. Can, can we look for future um, British candy on the uh, JetBlue flights in, in the future, and we can thank you for it? Oh, more more than your better count or eat. Excellent, excellent. Um, Wick, what, what's your favorite guilty? Well, I don't feel guilty because Amelia is fully Italian American, but uh, I get a lot of pasta, amazing pasta, and if I don't have two plates, she makes me feel guilty. So I mean, there's just lots of carbs. And, and as I mentioned food, I, sh I should mention Amelia and, and, and several of, of you, including yourself, Wick, uh, has a tequila business out there. Um, I don't know what JetBlue serves as tequila on their flights, but it, this seems like an opportune time to, uh, to offer high-end tequila on those flights. I so think that's right. We'd be glad to do a, yeah. a deal. We, yeah. Seguro Tequila is actually, we're outselling Plaza Azul in... <laughs> in three states at the moment and we're only 10 months old it's got, gotten a lot of uh, great reception so you ought to try it i'll if you if you imbibe robin i'll be glad to send you a bottle yeah right. i would uh, i think i think i have to sample that before i can make any further commitment <laughs> okay great <laughs> <laughs> wonderful well um again again thanks for the lightning round my, my last question is is a little bit more serious in nature and wick i will start with you but as we've done these over the summer um, and, and fall now, we've had about 12 of these. Uh, and I stole this idea from Linda Henry in an interview I saw her do. I like to finish these on a positive note. And so I'm going to ask each of you to give us a brief, a message of hope, something that our members and all of us can take from today's session uh, that, that gives us something to look forward to, that gives us something positive. In today's world, it's, it's, it's so needed. And so I'd love to, to get briefly from, from each of you um, a message of hope. And, and Wick, I will start with you to see, um, in addition to a couple of more wins, what, what's your message of hope for all of us? appreciate that. <clears throat> Gosh, I've been trying to think about how 2020 would go down in history, what we can take out of this sort of disastrous year. And I think maybe it's the awakening towards the racial inequity and the systemic racism that we have here in the States and how ignorant, I'll say I personally was of it, not willfully ignorant, but I think I was ignorant and complacent. And I didn't realize that, that, I'm just embarrassed to say, I didn't realize that there was so much to do. And now I've started to learn and I'm trying to learn and trying to help do something about it. But 2020 is showing me that people do care. People are becoming awakened and people are going to, I do believe that there is going to be change, meaningful change for the better. It might take 10 or 20 years. I hope it doesn't, but it will. Um, but I, I'm, I'm seeing people become more committed to making the world a better place. And, uh, and I, I got snapped out of complacency, I, I promise. And I, I hope that I can follow through on that. And I think I'm seeing that in other people. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to take hope and solace in that. And, and I think that's wonderful. And uh, before I turn to Robin, and, and he and our members may not know, um, the Boston Celtics, behind your leadership and Steve Pagliuca and, and some others, have made a significant commitment to this um, area. Beyond just words and platitudes, um, that organization has put a flag on the ground and said, this matters. Can you tell us just very briefly a little bit about that so that uh, Robin and others could hear? Oh, well, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I, well, thank you for asking. I'll be very brief. There, we have made a commitment both at the NBA level and then at the Celtics level to put very significant resources behind what we're calling Celtics United. And it does involve corporate partners such as JetBlue also signing on and becoming engaged over time, which we appreciate. But it's, a, it's to really try to make a difference for the better. And Steve Pelyuka has been the leader of it on our side, along with our players and uh, Allison Feaster and Dave Hoffman on our staff. And so there are many people uh, turning our attention to it. And the entire ownership of the NBA in partnership with the players is trying to do um, 
uh, the NBA Cares Initiative as well. So thanks for mentioning it. And it, the Celtics have been leaders in civil rights, world leaders really, since the true great people ran the Celtics years ago. The first black player, the first all black starting five, and the first black head coach were all Celtics. And so leading the way, and so if you're trying to help bring that forward as I am, your obligation and commitment all the way into your DNA needs to be to try to do uh, a good job in that area, and we're, and we're trying. Yet another reason for those of us across the country to, to cheer on the Boston Celtics for all that you do for the community. So, so again, thank you. Uh, not, Robin, everybody on this call is doing it, and that I yeah. thank you for asking about us, but I know there's many people doing much more, but thank you. No, absolutely. I, th I think it has been a commitment across the board for, from so many. Uh, Robin, I, I turn to you for the last word. Uh, a message of hope from, from you. Um, what is it that, that you can leave us with as a positive note? Well, uh, by the way, uh, you know, um, just really appreciate everything the uh, Boston Celtics have, have done to uh, you know, make a stand and, and support the uh, issues around um, racial equality and, and social justice. And I fully agree. I mean, I feel that it was different this time. And I feel that, by the way, in our world, I, I talk about the new form of shareholder activism it's going to be companies that don't have a genuine commitment to this, not just talking about it. And it's funny, you know, one of the things that we talked about JetBlue is that like, before we sort of issue the proclamations and all of the press releases saying we agree, let's get our own house in order. What are the things that we can do internally to really ensure that we are committed to, um, you know, a, a much higher level of performance uh, around the, um, the uh, things we need to do to make sure that we are taking care of all of our crew members from all of the communities that we fly to. So I think it's, it is different this time. So I think that's one positive thing. I think the other thing is we will get through this. I think all the new relationships and all the opportunities that some of us had this year that we never thought we would get. So I don't know about other people, but I've got a, a son at college and a, another son who'd left college and was at work. And, you know, I thought they were gone forever. And we had an amazing time when they were back with us for six months and, you know, the chance to build those relationships and also uh, appreciate people that maybe do jobs that if we are honest, we didn't do enough before. So when everyone was sheltering in place um, and scared to go out, of course, we had healthcare workers in the front line. But, you know, the people that work at our grocery store, those were, those were my heroes. Uh, and the chance to not just walk by someone who's stacking a shelf, but say, just thank you for what you're doing and thank you for being there for all of us and keeping the economy and the country going. So I think, as I reflect back at 2020, I think we can all use that to show a greater appreciation of the things that people do around us uh, that perhaps we just walk by and make sure that everyone feels what they're doing uh, is of a special calling and there's a, a unique value to all of us. And hopefully some of that can stay and, and rise above the rancor of the you know, very partisan political environment that we find ourselves in today. I, I, I can't, couldn't agree more with, with either of, of what you have to say. I, I think that looking back on this pandemic, we hope that this brings forth positive, meaningful change and that we grow from this, certainly as community, as leaders. Um, so I, I am heartened to hear from, from both of you on that. Uh, with that, I look at the clock. It is 1.15. I did promise prompt German as, as always. Um, so I want to thank WIC uh, for your support and friendship over these years and for joining us and introducing um, Robin. Robin, for you and your entire team, uh, they've been fantastic to deal with. Uh, I appreciate uh, you bringing Donnie in for so many of our members and, and for you taking the time. Um, so on behalf of Boston College and the Chief Executives Club, thank you to, to both of you for, for being here today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Wick, thank you. Thank you so much. For our, for our members, this will be available uh, on YouTube uh, starting tomorrow. You also, everyone will get an invitation uh, for our next event a week from tomorrow on October 2nd. Ramon LaGuarta, Chairman, CEO, and President of PepsiCo will be joining me. Uh, he will be introduced by Mike White, uh, the retired CEO, Chairman, and President of Direct TV. So again, thank you everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, go JetBlue and, and go Celtics. Take care everyone. Thank you. Cheers.